Hey all, Tom Moran here from Tom's Big Spiders. This episode is going to be all about moisture dependent species, how to keep them, and the best ways to make sure that your tarantulas stay hydrated. I know that moisture dependent species tend to freak out a lot of hobbyists, especially those that are just moving into them, and I totally get it because when I first got mine years ago, it was a constant source of anxiety because I wasn't quite sure how to keep them moist, what was too moist, what was the best way to keep the substrate moist. So in this episode, we're just going to run through what I do and some of the tricks that I found work very well for keeping the species that appreciate a little bit of moisture. So enough of me talking, let's get into the actual video. Okay, so this is going to be a bit of a tutorial on how to maintain moisture in tarantula enclosures and how to maintain moisture-dependent species because I know there's a lot of confusion about it and it tends to be the cause of a lot of stress for new keepers. Now, to make it very clear, and I'll probably state this in the intro that I'll shoot later, but we're not talking about humidity here. That's considered to be a dirty word in the hobby because of all the care sheets out there that put arbitrary humidity requirements. A lot of folks end up buying those cheap Zoomed hygrometers and they stick them inside the cages and try to measure the humidity inside the cages. I have done that exactly once in my life. It was very early on. Since then, I've kept 120 species. I never monitor humidity inside the cages. What you have is either arid species, something in between, or what we refer to as moisture-dependent species. And for moisture-dependent species, the key is to keep substrate moist. Now, one thing right off the bat, and I'm going to illustrate on this enclosure here, when we're talking about moist, moist substrate, we're not worried about those upper levels. We want the bottom levels to be moist. The majority of tarantula species that require moisture will burrow to find it. Even some of the ones that aren't particularly moisture dependent, like some of the Afonopelma species, will burrow to find moisture in the wild. So what we want is to maintain the moisture levels down here. We don't fixate on the moisture levels up here. When I first got into keeping moisture dependent tarantulas, I definitely overdid it because every time the top of the substrate started to dry up even the littlest bit, I would add more water in. And what I was probably creating was kind of a damp, fetid environment for my tarantula. I could have done more harm than good. Now, right off the bat, a lot of people talk about spraying, and I'm going to put a couple of the spray bottles here. For a while, these were considered to be the devil because a lot of old husbandry videos and a lot of old husbandry sheets talk about misting, and that was the way you kept your tarantula moist. Even back in the 90s when I got my first, everything talked about misting. Misting is a great way to supplement some of the other things I'm going to show in a minute in this video. I use it for a lot of my arboreal species. What will happen is when you mist, you spray down the whole enclosure and it causes a huge burst of air, which let's call it as it is. Spiders, all those hairs on them are a sense organ. They can feel that very easily and it disturbs the spiders. So that's why a lot of people will warn you against spraying because it can set off the spiders. Now, the other issue with spraying is when I spray and soak something down, and we're going to do an insert here in a moment where you'll get to see how we do it. If I'm spraying and soaking down the substrate, it's only soaking down that top layer. You're likely to get only about an inch or so of this top stuff moist while the bottom stuff doesn't get any moisture at all. And unfortunately, what will happen is especially in the winter time when the furnaces are running and the heat's going and the air is very dry, that moisture will evaporate very, very quickly. So you're giving your spider limited access to moisture in those regards. Now, people will use spraying and they use it successfully, but it requires much more diligence than what I'm about to show you guys. So I know somebody will come on and say, well, I use spraying. Maybe you do. It just takes a lot more work, honestly, than what we're going to do in a moment. Now, as far as keeping these things moist, what we want to do when I add moisture to my enclosure, the running gag is, and I move the light over here, is I make it rain. So what I do is look for that moisture level to be going down. Now, if you notice here, we have moist substrate in the corner over here. Hopefully that's showing up. I'll move the light. And we have our dry stuff up here. And as we go around the front, we see it's getting just a bit dry in here. This is all kind of dry. So I want to add a little moisture to it. Now, one way the way I like to do it is to make it rain. This is the water bottle we've been using. Oh gosh, I think I don't think we've had chillers in the house for about five or six years. I don't think they make it anymore. I don't even think they make it anymore. <laughs> no. Oh, this is a collector's item. So we have a Welcher's chillers bottle. What I did was burned a bunch of holes in the top. I think I used a little nail. So make almost like a watering can like we'd use for your garden. And instead of misting, when we mist, if I were to mist this enclosure, and luckily this one right now is in pre molt and buried, so this isn't going to bother it. This is only hitting the top. Now again, if this was nighttime before bed and this spider wasn't in its burrow in primo, they will come up, they'll siphon the water off of the glass. If there's plants in here, they'll sometimes drink off it. I've seen my avicularia do it. I've seen my Pisolotheria species do it. So it's a good way to give them an extra spot to drink, but that will evaporate very, very quickly. What we want to do instead is simulate the old downpour. 
And when you add the moisture, what you want to look for is you want it to go in between the glass and the substrate so it gets down to these bottom levels. A lot of times if you're using a plastic enclosure, what you can do is take your thumbs, loop it in, it really comes up here, stretch it apart a little bit, which will create a little void between the sides, and then I dump water right down in there. That's a nice way to do it. Another way is if it's not sinking down, you can always add little furrows with the back of a paintbrush. And I've had people say, you know, I can't get it to sink down. And then what happens is when you pour the water in, it'll go down into those little furrows. And as you'll see, it's spreading much more down into the bottom layers. So the trick is we don't worry so much about the top layers. Don't obsess over that. It can dry up a little bit. Now, again, if you're doing a bioactive enclosure, you kind of have to keep the top layers somewhat moist to maintain humidity or the moisture for your feeder insects and your plants. But overall, you can let some of that stuff dry out. Now, we're going to cap this one before this one decides to come out of primo and come in bolt. Now, for slings, a lot of people freak out about the slings. They can be very stressful. Here we have just a generic sling enclosure that I've made up. There's no sling in here. But what you want to do is find where the sling burrows. So usually you'll see a little spot of webbing, and the sling will be down in here. Maybe I'll do a little insert of the sling burrow in here just to illustrate better. And one way you can add water to slings, you can mist, but keep in mind, misting into that enclosure, you want to be very, very careful to make sure that you don't spray too much because the sling is going to go nuts and go right out of the enclosure. I find the best way to do it is to use either a pipette or some people will use syringes. And basically what you can do is put the pipette right where you want it to go, squirt a little moisture in there, and notice it directed, it went right down, I'll hold it under here, it goes right down into the bottom. So you can basically use this to get it right where you need to go, the opposite side of the enclosure, put some moisture in it, squirt it right down the bottom. Again, you want the lower levels to maintain that moisture because your tarantula will dig to the level it needs. Now, what I hear sometimes and people forget about is we talk about arboreal species and people will talk about arboreal species. Some of them require moisture, but you'll read a lot of care guides that will tell you you don't need to put a lot of moisture in. I've seen people that put like an inch of moisture in. I like to give some of my, especially the ones that are slings and juveniles that I know are going to need some moisture, several inches of substrate. Because another thing you want to think about when keeping a moisture dependent species is how much substrate you're going to put in there. That is no spot or no position to be a substrate scrooge where you don't put a lot of substrate in. Even if I'm keeping a terrestrial tarantula, if I know it's going to require moisture, so I'm thinking about like my Pamphibedia species or my Theraphosa or even some of my Formictopus, I want to give them several inches of substrate because if I only give this an inch of substrate, pour some water in, that's going to evaporate much quicker. With some of the arboreal species, they will burrow. So as we will see here, and this is one I did a rehousing on not that long ago, this one has created like a little spot behind the cork bark, done a little burrowing in here. If it wanted more moisture, it could go down even deeper. And as a matter of fact, we're going to have to add more moisture in a minute because this is starting to dry up. So even with species like terrestrial species and arboreal species, ignore stuff that says you can put them on an inch of substrate. If you think they're moisture dependent, if you think they're going to appreciate some moisture, what you want to do is make sure that you give them an extra depth of substrate so that you can add in the moisture and have it locked in. Because the trick is you want to not have to check them every single day to make sure it's not evaporating. Some of the methods like using the misting, you have to check them more often. Is it wrong? No. Does it make a lot more work for you and increase the chances of the substrate drying out inappropriately for your tarantula? Yes, it does. So that's why I want to do it that way. All right. Now, another thing to consider when setting up a moisture dependent species is the type of substrate you're going to use. For years, people use only the cocoa fiber and cocoa fiber can work. I hear complaints about the fact it can collapse on the tarantulas. It doesn't hold its shape well. That's not really the case because what will happen is they will web up inside the cocoa fiber. But when I moved away from cocoa fiber is when I started keeping moisture dependent species because quite frankly, it doesn't hold on to the moisture very well. It absorbs it like a sponge. So one of the good points of cocoa fiber is if you're trying to moisten it down and you're pouring water in, it soaks right in, soaks right into the substrate very, very easily. But the downside is it evaporates much more quickly than other substrates. And my son Ron and I did like a test several years ago. We played with different types of substrates and the cocoa fiber always gave up the moisture more quickly. So it can be used, but you're going to want to use deep levels and make sure you get to those lower levels with the moisture and you're going to need to be more diligent as far as keeping it moist. Now I've used topsoil 
Topsoil works great. It holds on to moisture very well. Unfortunately, you tend to get the mudding effect when you try to add moisture. So what will happen is you'll pour water in and if it is dried out, the water will tend to pool on the top and just create a muddy puddle. So again, that's where you're gonna to wanna to spend more time with putting those divots in the side to make sure it goes down the side and filters in the bottom. I've also found that mixing it with vermiculite, usually 70, 30 or 60, 40, depending on the species, works well. You can also cut up sphagnum moss and put pieces of sphagnum moss in, which allows the water to percolate down better and people have also used sand for it. And as far as peat, peat's another popular one, that stuff will absorb water off the bat really well and hold on to water. Like you can keep peat moist for quite some time. The problem with peat is if it's dry, it's very dusty. And if the substrate does dry out and you try to rehydrate it, again, you get that dusty effect beforehand and then you get the muddy effect as soon as you try to add moisture to it. So again, mixing it with some vermiculite, some sand, or some sphagnum is a great way to kind of increase that water flow down through the substrate because we don't want it puddling on top, we want it down the bottom where it burrows. All right, another thing, back in the old literature, I believe the Tarantula Keeper's Guide had this and a lot of old husbandry videos and books will talk about restricting ventilation. When you're keeping moisture dependent species, you do not want to restrict ventilation. You want good, ideally cross ventilation now, Truth be told, the ones here do not have the cross ventilation, but these are the bioactive. This is a bioactive enclosure. This one here has got a lot of ventilation in top. The only problem with the ventilation on the top is that you'll have to be a little more diligent with maintaining the moisture levels in here because it will evaporate much more quickly. And we did do a little experiment with this a couple of years back where we had one enclosure that had top ventilation, another one that had cross ventilation, and the one with top ventilation, the water was gone much more quickly. But ideally, you want good ventilation. I will cover up the tops of my critter keepers because they have the top ventilation and the ventilation around the sides of the enclosure. The top tends to be overkill, so I'll cover that up a little bit, leave that side ventilation, and in some cases put holes in the actual clear acrylic part of the Critter Keeper to keep that airflow going through. Now, the other thing you'll hear mentioned often is giving your tarantula a moist corner. Usually we do this with species that may or may not appreciate some moisture. So for example, B. albopilo or T. albopilosum comes to mind as a species where some people's T. albopilosums seem to appreciate some moisture, others seem to abhor it. So you kind of give your tarantula a moist corner. Now you do the same thing we would do with one of these, but instead of having the moisture go all the way through here, I would pick a corner, maybe a third or a fourth of the aquarium or tank, add water in, let it sink down, but I would only do it in that corner. Now, if your spider digs in that corner, that's probably a spider that would appreciate some more moisture and you wanna moisten some more substrate down. But I hear a lot of people get confused, like does that just mean the surface? Does that just mean you know only one little tiny corner? It's really kind of arbitrary. It just means you don't have to keep all of the substrate moist. You can pick one part of the tank, keep it moist, and then what usually keepers will do is they will move the corner so that it doesn't stay moist in one corner for the whole time. So it might be this corner one month, I come over here, this dries out, I moist in this corner, let that dry out, move over to this one. Now, one thing to think about when keeping moisture dependent species is the humidity in the place that you're actually from. So for example, a lot of my friends from the Philippines have a naturally humid environment and I've had people email me or message me and say, hey, is this gonna be a little bit of an overkill if I soak down the substrate? And the short answer is yes. If you're in a place where you get high humidity, so for example, we're in Connecticut where it gets quite humid in the summertime, we get humidity in the tarantula room hits like 80s, humidity outside hits 80s and 90s, then you don't need to be as diligent keeping these things moist. You can kind of lay off a little bit. What I usually do is let the cages dry out, but I always keep the water dishes full and then I may miss a corner or something just in case they want to drink off the glass. But you do have to keep and take into account your local conditions, your local environment. If it's really humid, again, I just had somebody, actually Malaysia was the other one, somebody contacted me from asking me the same question. You can lay off a little bit because you kind of have the perfect environment for these species anyway. So you don't want to go overboard with the humidity. Now, Lastly, we always want to keep water dishes when it permits. I know with the little dram bottles like these, I know people do the Lego ones and stuff, but it can be very difficult to keep a water dish in there and keep it full for any amount of time. But once they get into something a little bigger, 16 ounce deli cups, yes, the little mainstay containers, whatever you may be using, something like this, we definitely always want to have water dishes. And if keeping a moisture dependent species, if you want to make sure the substrate doesn't dry out even faster, one thing you can use, one trick you can use is add extra water 
water dishes. So for example, here is a picture of my Pamphibedius Antonis and her enclosure, and you can see there are two large water dishes in there. When I set her up, I did not use as much substrate as I probably would have if I did it now, but that adding those two water dishes in there kind of keeps the water level inside the, inside the container up a little bit and keeps it from drying out as quickly. And there's nothing wrong with putting a couple water dishes in enclosures. Not only does, again, it keeps the water from evaporating quickly, but your spider has a couple places it can drink from. So hopefully that helps to explain a little bit how I keep moisture dependent species. It's really not that difficult. If you do the work correctly to begin with, if you start off with moist substrate and just make sure you don't let it dry out completely as it goes on, you should be completely fine. It's really not that bad to do. And keep in mind that again, although misting has its place and I'm not totally against misting and I do misting and some spraying in some of my enclosures, it's not the best way to maintain a moisture dependent species in my opinion. All right, so again, it's not about that upper level, it's about the lower levels. We wanna make sure that those lower levels don't dry out. I think a lot of us make the mistake when we first get into the hobby with fixating on the fact that the top starts to dry up. We're like, oh no, this thing's gonna to get too dry. We start pouring in more water, then we end up with fetid conditions that are not conducive to tarantula, good tarantula health. So I think that's a big issue right now that we have in the hobby is that when we talk about moisture dependent species and keeping the substrate moist, we never really break it down and explain how to do it how much and what are some things to look for. So hopefully this one helped out a bit for some of you that are just getting into the hobby and into keeping these moisture dependent species. And for some folks, hopefully maybe they stumble on this video before they get into it and it just alleviates some of the stress that can come with it. Now, just to let everybody know, I have been more active on my website lately and what I'm going to start to do is post up articles that kind of coincide with some of the videos I do. So there will be an article version of this on tomsbigspiders.com. Also, I have the podcast podcast and there'll be a podcast episode about it. So hopefully people that don't necessarily like the videos as much or want to see a text version of it can go over there, print it out, make notes, do whatever you need to. Or if you want to hear me get into it a little more in depth, because obviously we only have so much time in a video, then you can go over the podcast, hop over and listen to that. So as always, thanks so much for everybody who's taken the time to listen. If you've never checked out any of my videos before and want to check out more, I'll put them over here. If you like this video enough that you want to subscribe immediately, very much appreciated. You can click the little circle right up there. I do answer all my messages. It can take me a couple days because I've been tending to get a lot of them lately, but know that if you do put a message on there or post a comment, I will answer it. As always, thanks so much. Hope to catch you guys next time.